Well, as you know, our speaker today is Lowell Bergman, who is Professor Emeritus of our Graduate School of Journalism, in which he held the Riva and David Logan Distinguished Chair in Investigative Reporting, that program being one that Lowell also founded and directed for some years. I'm especially pleased to have Lowell with us today, given how hard it was to get him. <laughs> I first approached him about the possibility almost two years ago, and he was, uh, let's just say, evasive. <laughs> and it wasn't until Guy Miko and I ambushed him at the downtown Berkeley YMCA, where we all used to work out, that we actually got him to commit to a date, a date that was then well in the future, March 7 now well in the past. And Lowell, you've been a, a very good sport about both the delay and the switch to Zoom. Appreciate it. Bergman was born in New York, went to college at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, then grad school at UC San Diego, uh, where he went in part to stud study philosophy with Herbert Marcuse, who was there at that time. This is the later 60s. In San Diego, Lowell and his group there, um, friends and fellow students, became skeptical about the two local newspapers, uh, the San Diego Union and the San Diego Tribune. They started their own underground paper, the San Diego Free Press, which ended up exposing San Diego uh, corruption in which the other two newspapers were involved. <laughs> um, so that's more or less the beginning, and the rest is history. Google Lowell Bergman, and you'll see story upon story upon story, as well as, for Lowell himself, descriptors like no better journalist in the country, a living legend of investigative journalism, one of the greatest American investigative reporters of all time, and so on. And his main target over the decades has been institutional malfeasance, notably corporate industry, graft and corruption at the expense of the public and or workers. And I'm just gonna mention two very well-known cases. One has to do with the cast iron sewer and water pipe industry. And that's Lowell's expose of the systematic violations of environmental laws and worker safety rules for which the workers were paying a terrible health uh, cost. The other case was Big Tobacco back in the 90s in which Bergman managed to bring to light the fact that the leaders of Brown and Williamson not only knew perfectly well that smoking was not just harmless fun, but addictive and indeed made more so by chemical additives <laughs> and could have serious um, health consequences. But what's to me most remarkable about Lowell is not only his amazing ability to get stories, but his amazing ability to get those stories out there, both in print and on screen, um, including notably television venues like ABC News, CBS's 60 Minutes, and PBS's Frontline, for all of which he has served variously over the years as a correspondent, producer, and or director. His New York Times story on the sewer water pipe industry was turned into a TV program called A Dangerous Business, winning not only a Pulitzer Prize for public service, but just about every major award in broadcasting. And then of course there's the Insider, a major Hollywood film about the tobacco story in which Lowell is played by Al Pacino as he works to get an industry insider to come forward. It's kind of weird to watch that movie if you know Lowell and to hear Al Pacino being called Lowell in the movie. <laughs> um, Lowell, I think I remember you're once telling me about being on the set during the making of that film and being asked to leave for objecting to the way that, that Pacino was shouting his lines. <laughs> you're, you're definitely not a shouter. You're more like an ironic commenter. <laughs> anyway, with your 50 years in this business, you know firsthand uh, 
you've seen a lot of changes in what constitutes truth. You're well positioned to be aware of how information, truth, sources, evidence have all changed over the years. And I expect that's what you're going to be talking about now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Carol. Um, and and uh, thank you for bothering me so that I couldn't finish working out on my cross trainer. Um, and uh, let me say that that um, this is this is the first time I've I mean I've had Zoom meetings, but it's the first time I've been like a speaker at a at a Zoom meeting. So uh, I'm not exactly sure how to conduct myself, but I'm just going to try to relax and and talk with you about a couple of things today. Um, and and just and just to explain something just to start because as Carol was talking about um, how I got into journalism, um, just briefly, let me say that that I started out um, back in 1963, 62, 63. I would have described myself as an activist academic. I went to the Turn Toward Peace demonstration in Washington D.C. in 1962. We were trying to ban the bomb. Um, it, uh, we were in front of the White House, 5,000 students, and we were being served coffee by Robert Kennedy. Um, very different kind of demonstration than I would find later on or that we'd see today. Um, I was at the March on Washington. I was, a, if you will, a logistical supporter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I got deeply involved in, in that, those activities. I think I wrote something recently to the journalism school students and related people about meeting John Lewis and when I was 18 years old in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and then many years later in 19, I think it was 2011 or 12, um, that we met at the Robert F. Kennedy Awards. We had talked a couple of times over the years and we were getting our pictures taken in, of course, we got these awards and, uh, and uh, John turned to me and said, you know, the last time we had our pictures taken was mugshots. And so, uh, and that was my background in the 60s and I pursued um, at the University of Wisconsin um, uh, because I ran into two German expatriate professors. One is named George Mossy, he was a historian um, and the other was Hans Gerth, a sociologist, oh, who was the mentor of C. Wright Mills. Some of you may have yeah. seen C. Wright Mills, you're familiar with him. Retired journalist. And, and both of them uh, were obsessed with how could, how could it have happened in Germany? Mossy, who was really an expert on cultural history in Europe, turned his whole career into the history of anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazis and the, and the uh, conditions in Germany that made them possible. Uh, he would become the first uh, uh, scholar at the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, which is the last place I saw him before he passed away. Hans Gerth uh, was literally someone who had read everything. I mean, literally in almost every language. And um, he's the one who, who turned me on the, to the idea of looking for a social theory that could integrate Marx and Freud uh, could humanize uh, socialism and concepts I'd never heard of before. And he's the one who recommended me to Herbert Marcuse, who was in San Diego. So I arrived in San Diego um, kind of regretting that I was no longer politically involved in various things, but at the same time, totally blown away by the setting for the university and the idea that you could get anything done. Um, but in fact, what happened there is I got introduced to and got my first migraine headache studying Hegel's Science of Logic in a seminar with Marcuse and the likes of Angela Davis, Bill Lease, and others uh, who would make different careers in the years to come. Uh, but while we were there, something happened that uh, eventually would get me into journalism. Uh, Marcuse became very famous in 1967. He went to Europe and he was uh, invited to speak to 30,000 students in Rome, introduced at the, at the time by a man known Dan as Danny the Red, a German 
French German student who was head of the German SDS. And he immediately became a sort of cultural phenomenon. Well, news of this came back to the United States. It ran on the AP wire and it was picked up by the San Diego Union Tribune. And, I, and when people talk about news deserts today, I think of San Diego in the 60s and many other cities in the South and across America where the newspapers were terrible, including the ones in San Francisco. You may remember that the San Francisco Chronicle, a lot of people bought the Chronicle because they had the New York Times news service. So you could get some international news on the front page. If you, if you bought the Examiner, then the, the afternoon paper in the 60s, uh, it rarely had anything that you would call investigative. And when it was, was done, it was done by a guy named Ed Montgomery, who was a favorite of J. Edgar Hoover's and used to publish leaks from the FBI about Berkeley on the front page of the paper. So it, I think it's good for all of us to think about what the past was like in reality, as opposed to imagining it today as some kind of golden age of, of news coverage and, and the news. What happened in San Diego was that once Ronald Reagan, then the governor and a regent and the newspapers started campaigning to get Marcuse fired because he was obviously a communist and a subversive and so on. That was one thing. But the next thing that happened was Marcuse's house was assaulted by men bearing arms who shot up his garage door. Then they cut his telephone lines. Then they sent him death threats. They knocked on the door and left signs saying, you'll be dead. He and his wife, survivors of Nazi Germany, fled Berkeley at one point, fled, fled San Diego for Berkeley to stay with Leo Lowenthal, one of his old friends from Germany. And then they came back. And I and my fellow students who enjoyed living in San Diego and being on the beach and were all like I had a fellowship and God, someone was paying me to do this. We wound up being his bodyguards because when these incidents happened, the police didn't show up. So that experience in 1967, late 1967, early 1968, had a bunch of us decide that we wanted to start an alternative newspaper in San Diego. It was a news desert, but it was also the staging area for the war in Vietnam. And I tell you that background because I then went from being an activist academic into journalism and began to learn journalism by doing it, but also began to understand that a lot of my preconceptions about the world did not involve testing what I thought was true with real people. Actually going out and meeting the people I thought, let's say, were the enemy and finding out how things actually worked. With the academic background, primarily given to me by uh, Hans Goethe about how power structures operated and who was in power and what was really going on as opposed to what appeared to be going on. And definitely in the media in San Diego, um, what was really going on was not in the newspaper. It was on the society page, sometimes on the business page. And make a long story short, because it took about two years, we focused on who really ran the city and county of San Diego. To everyone in town, it was a revelation. We focused on Mr. San Diego of the century, who was a, that's, that was his title. He was given that title in 1969. He was Richard Nixon's best friend in California, his first major supporter, and the only person who sat at the Waldorf Astoria to go to sit through the election returns in 1968. And his partner, who was Mr. San Diego of the Year in 1969, also known as Mr. Tijuana, who handled the Democrats, the two of them were in business together. And we quick, quickly found by, by doing stories about them, public record stories about from documents, and then we began to get tips and information that this was a criminal capitalist enterprise that was going on, hiding in plain sight in the city and in the county. Now, our, um, our newspaper attracted the same vigilantes who went after Herbert Marcuse. They firebombed our car. 
they just they broke into our offices and destroyed our equipment, typesetting equipment, and so on. No one would publish us in San, in San Diego, so we had to take printing plates up to uh, Los Angeles to get published. They uh, one issue of the newspaper, eight thousand copies of a fifteen thousand uh, copy run was dumped into Mission Bay. Um, I could go on and on and on. A we had a whole section of the paper in, uh, on a weekly basis called Uncovering Undercover Agents because the police and the FBI were trying to run in people, informants into our operation. And we'd figured out a very simple way of discovering who they were because people, we'd ask people to fill out a, a form and just simply write where they were born and where their parent, were, who their parents and where did they live. And we actually started checking them. And, those became stories. Uh, so the police were not very sophisticated. Uh, there's a document that would show you the kind of press criticism we were getting at the time from the federal government. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there it goes. I got this uh, about six years later on a freedom of information request for my FBI file. It's dated 72370. It's July of, uh, it's one day short of my birthday. Um, in July of 1970, and we had already done many of these stories. Well, it turned out that those stories and our other, other, uh, other parts of the newspaper that reported on the black community and the Hispanic community uh, got the attention of the FBI. We were, there's in fact a whole COINTELPRO operation, counterintelligence operation, that it turned out the FBI was running the vigilante organization and that, and that the leader of it was a paid informant and operative. So they decided to uh, put me in the summer of, of uh, 1970 on what was called uh, the security, well, to issue a security index card, which meant that I would become one of 15,000 people who would be picked up in the event of an insurrection or a national emergency. And I'm in group two, if you can see the whole document, and I can only see part of it here. But I, what they did have a problem with yeah, there it is. So it says priority two. That meant, I found out later from the church committee hearings in 1976 that this was 15,000 people who had been designated to go on this list. And then it tries to say what I'm connected to. And it, you can see communist is an empty box in the middle. Um, and uh, PLP, which stands for Progressive Labor Party, which were the Maoists. I'm definitely not one of them. Um, but they they, they checked a box or put a cross on a box called ANA. And ANA, I couldn't figure out what does that mean. And finally, in 1980, by now, the FBI has changed what it was doing and what its priorities were. And I had many sources in the Bureau and still do. And, uh, and I, I had a, 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 um, a, what's called an SAC, a special agent in charge, who was old enough to go back 10 years and I, had, I showed him this document and I said, what's ANA? He said, oh, well, it's clear. You don't belong to anything. So they did anarchist. So that, that was the atmosphere. And that was a kind of um, re feedback that I got from the stories that we were doing uh, out of this small newspaper. We lasted about two years. We eventually left town after an undercover operation disrupted, disrupted all of our uh, activities. And in my FBI file, they, they write a congratulatory memo about how they've, destruct, they've disrupted almost all anti-war activity in, in the San Diego area. Um, and I thought as a result, my mother, for instance, would always say to me when I, she was in New York, but she would always say to me, they're going to kill you or you're going to wind up in jail. And in fact, years later, decades later, when uh, Bill Moyers gave a talk about a, about a documentary I did with him uh, and was going on and on and on about me, Bill is like a, you know, a Baptist preacher. And so I, it was like my funeral he was going on and saying these wonderful things about me. Afterwards, my mother ran up to him and said, you know, we always thought he'd go to the penitentiary. So you can laugh about it now, and I can too, but that's the reality of what was going on then. And if you, want to, if you haven't read it or haven't looked at it, I suggest to all of you as a great project in investigative reporting is a book called Subversives by Seth Rosenfeld. 
And Seth was then an undergraduate when he, he um, filed his first Freedom of Information request in the late 70s. He lived next door to me uh, on her street in Berkeley. And uh, he was working for the Daily Cal and he was asking me, what can I do to find out more? And he started out doing that. And for 30 years, he went to court. He gathered 350,000 documents about Berkeley authored by the FBI in the 1960s. If you haven't looked at it and gone through it, you will be surprised. I think the most surprising thing will be the number of informants inside the university that the FBI had in the chancellor's office, in Clark Kerr's office. You will be surprised by some of the articles that came out afterwards because Seth kept getting more information and still does today. Who started various minority studies uh, departments at UC Berkeley and what the FBI involvement was. So that was, that was the, the, uh, the cauldron I came out of. And clearly I was an activist with, with a perspective. But, but the other thing that happened to me in that experience was I ran, because of the nature of the stories we were publishing, all of a sudden, we were being contacted by sources, not just sources who lived in the houses of some of the people involved, but law enforcement, not the FBI, but agencies like what was called IRS intelligence, criminal investigators inside the IRS who pursued people with assets. They became, and for me, a, they changed me in many ways. They introduced me to the concept of honest cops. They introduced me to regulators in the state and federal government who were looking at labor practices or looking at, at, at uh, condition, SEC investigators and others. And I began to broaden my experience in such a way that I started to appreciate that in fact, things weren't as simple as I thought they were, that academic uh, an academic study often forgets the nuance that exists in the real world. And that in turn, with a, just curiosity, kept me in the business. And then the most surprising thing that happened, and I think it's a reason to have some hope in the present, because remember, in those days, the New York Times didn't do investigative reporting. It was a big deal when they hired Seymour Hersh after the My Lie story. The My Life Story of Seymour Hirsch was a freelancer. Investigative reporting was done by freelancers, primarily, and small publications or odd people like I.F. Stone. It wasn't done by your establishment media. The little of it that was on establishment media was a, an exception. You know, a documentary might appear now and then. 60 Minutes, for example, oh, and this is my, uh, this is my question that I always ask my students, so I'll ask you guys to think about. 60 Minutes was on the air starting in 1968. No one watched it. It was on in prime time. They weren't sure what they were doing. They were doing this, they were doing that. It was two correspondents. It was Harry Reasoner and Mike Wallace. Uh, it took until 1973 for 60 Minutes to wind up at 7 o'clock on Sundays. And then it took off. Now, why did 60 Minutes succeed at seven o'clock on Sundays? That's my question. We can talk about it when we get to the question and answer period. If you, if you know you can Google it, you can probably figure it out. But if you haven't thought about it, it has to do with what I'm gonna to get to shortly. Um, so when I, when, you know, when, when I got into this business, it was not a popular thing to do. The only institution that existed in the country that would support you as a freelancer for expenses to do an article was called the Fund for Investigative Journalism. It was started in 1968 a guy, by a guy named Phil Stern, who uh, uh, inherited some of the Sears and Roebuck fortune. And that was the one place you can go. He's the guy who gave Cy Hirsch the money to fly to Georgia to do the interviews that led to the My Lie story. He's the guy or that institution that gave me some money, some money, myself and Jeff Gerth, to, uh, who would later go to the New York Times and is now retired like me, a good friend 
uh, to fly to the Bahamas to try to figure out uh, how the $100,000 from Howard Hughes wound up with the Watergate burglars. That was it. There was no place else to go. No established news organization would help a freelancer do an investigative story that was risky in any way. And very few of them ever did it anyway. From that, we moved to a, a, a place within two to three years where people were paying me money to do this work. I was astounded. I said, I can both take out my, if you will, frustrations on criminal capitalists and I can get paid. The rest was easy after that. And in 1978, after, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy. I was, had moved up to the Bay Area and then Rolling Stone, where I worked, uh, moved to New York and I refused to move to New York. So I got fired on Christmas Eve, 1976. And I was out of a job as were a couple of other people. And so we decided to get together and we started the Center for Investigative uh, Reporting in my, in my living room in Berkeley on Hearst Street. Now, what's significant about that also to understand con in, in context is there was no other place to go to work in the Bay Area doing this kind of work, except for Ramparts Magazine, which had also was failing at that point. There literally was no place to work. And you, that would be a freelance thing, which I did with them at various moments. So we were actually just trying to create our own jobs. And then by, by, because I participated in something that many of you may not know, remember or know, in 1976, one of my contacts in the, in the established journalism world in, at the Arizona Republic, a man named Don Bowles, who was looking into a company called Emprise that controlled the uh, uh, concessions and 60 racetracks across America and almost all the professional and, and professional sports stadiums in America. A privately held company that operated out of a um, second floor of a, above a gas station in Buffalo, New York, um, uh, had, had all the concessions and the racetracks in Arizona. So Bowles had been working on them. And his literary, if you will, review was that he was driving through downtown Phoenix and his car blew up and he died. When the EMTs arrived, the last words he said was emprise. So a group of journalists from around the country at that time who had taken on doing what we call investigative reporting, particularly some people out of Newsday on Long Island who had made a mark by doing the, the uh, heroin trafficking in the United States and, tra and tracking where it came from, became the center group that organized 27 reporters, well, 26, I was number 27, um, to go to, to Arizona, do a series of stories cooperatively and try to make Arizona pay for killing one of us. You have to remember that it had been a long time since a journalist, a white journalist in the United States had been killed. Between 19, 1976, and um, in the present, very few journalists in the United States have been killed unless they were working for a foreign language newspaper. Um, and we have enjoyed, in, generally speaking, that kind of immunity. And we, and we did what we did in 76 and 77 uh, around Don Bowles in order to send a message. I can also tell you at that time, the New York Times, CBS, Wall Street Journal, um, all the established, most of the established newspapers in the United States and, and broadcasters would not participate. None of them believed in collaborating or cooperating. So it was out of that experience that we decided, well, we'll create our own job, which was the first nonprofit in the United States that did investigative reporting. Today, and this is the good news, today, the Center for Investigative Reporting still exists. It now has 60 employees or more. It's headquartered in Emeryville. It distributes nationally. It's on the radio every Saturday with Reveal. Um, and uh, it's not going anywhere. One of the best things about what's happened in the digital in the collapse of, this, of the newspaper model and the uh, advertising model 
is the proliferation of nonprofit investigative groups across the country. You know some of them, you've heard them like ProPublica, and you've heard maybe of the center, uh, but there are many more. There's the International Consortium of Investigative Reporters, which every now and then comes into the news because they've broken the code of secret banking operations worldwide. So on that level, and then real investigative reporting itself has become a commodity that now fills some of the major publications in this country. The New York Times did not have an investigative editor in place when we got the Pulitzer Prize in 2004 for a dangerous business. It was the first head of, there was a deputy to the managing editor who was considered to be the investigative editor, but not in name. The New York Times created in 2005 its first in-house investigative team. Investigative teams, by the way, didn't exist when I started out, except at Time Life, which had one in 68, as well as Newsday, that newspaper. Now we have investigative teams at the LA Times, just about anywhere where there's a publication. I would bet that today there is more in-depth reporting going on than ever before, at least in my lifetime, and it's being published and distributed. The only difference would be that the traditional networks are doing less of it. The traditional broadcasting operations, with the exception of PBS's Frontline, are doing less of it, as is radio. But in terms of local and nationally based organizations, that's where the future is in this business. And that's where many of my students have gone to work and there are in similar, similar organizations. So as we look at this, the real, the real problem in my view of what is happening today is that our work no longer has the impact it once had. Our work no longer results. Now I always told, told my students and you know, I started teaching part-time at Berkeley in 1991 and, and I would tell students, you know, you don't do these stories because you think you're going to change things. You may hope something changes, but you have to go at it because you have, you want to do it. You have to do it. You're compelled to do it. In fact, you have to do it and not get paid for it as well. In many cases to do it and actually do it thoroughly and make sure that your story is bulletproof. So, this issue of the impact of the stories and the fact that it doesn't have the, the uh, result you would expect is a result, is a, is, is a in my view, a uh, corollary to what has happened to the news media in general, in terms of in society, and the after effects of a process of deregulation of particularly electronic broadcasting that began in the early 1980s. And you can see along the years how this has happened because basically what happened in the 1980s along with what was the end of 50 years of regulation of electronic, electronic transmissions of information in the United States. Most people don't know and, it, and I'm sure some of you don't know who owns, for example, the internet. They're not told. The companies don't tell them any more than the broadcast television uh, companies. When I would talk to them, when I was inside of them, I would say, we should do a story or a series of public, public um, uh, with their PRAs, public, public uh, announced PAs, uh, public announcements that, you know, 30 second uh, spots that explain to people how our industry works. This explains to people how stories are edited. How did we get these stories? What is a cutaway? What is a correspondent? No one would, for, for decades until the digital revolution, no one was ever explaining to the audience the grammar of television production and news and what you are actually seeing as opposed to what we created. We created individuals that never made a mistake on the air. This still happens today. 
know the answer to every question, never lose an argument, seem to have done all the reporting, writing, and it's their story. And it's not true. And until, people, until technology enabled people to understand what editing is, if they bothered, and try to figure it out, people didn't know. And we didn't tell them. So in the course of all that, from the 1980s on, the, with the Reagan administration, the FCC abandoned all of the public interest, almost all of the public interest regulations that once made electronic transmission something to, to answer to a federal agency. The content was in a sense censored or influenced by the, the necessity that the broadcasters had to maintain their licenses, which, which were issued to them in the public interest. It's still true today. One of the cheapest and most valuable uh, licenses that's issued by the federal government is a broadcast license. It always surprises people, for instance, that only, to, I think today it costs $800 every three years to renew a broadcast license, whether it's for a multi-billion dollar station or for a tiny little radio station. It's supposed to be issued in the public interest to the best in the community. That's what the history of the regulation says. And from the beginning of electronic broadcasting, and this is something that I, that, uh, I, I, I'm going to share with you today. If you violated the public interest rules around your broadcast license, you could lose it. And that was a fear that everyone in the broadcast industry had through the mid 1980s. It started back in with radio. When radio started, it was just like the internet. It was chaos. Radio signals went over each other. And Herbert Hoover, the Secretary of Commerce under Calvin Coolidge, decided that we have to bring order to this chaotic marketplace where anything went, anything goes, especially if it's going to be commercial and especially if people are going to invest in it, but also that in his view, as he wrote at the time, it should be serving the public interest and operating as a, a means of mass education in America. So what Hoover did was create the Radio Commission, the first Radio Commission, and when he became president, he beefed it up and made it even more powerful. The result was that they got some complaints in the late 1920s about a about a, a radio station in Los Angeles called K, and let me get the name correctly here. It's, it's a story you'll find strangely prescient. Okay, I, I can think I can remember it now anyway by looking. Um, its call letters were K, KGEF was based in Los Angeles, and it was run by a, a, a preacher named um, Bob Schuler of the Trini Trinity Methodist Church. KGEF meant keep God ever first. And in the late 1920s, Schuler, in his uh, sermons, uh, had an audience that was estimated at 600,000 people. It was a powerful station in its day. What did he put on the air? Well, the complaints that came in was that he was, if you will, sermonizing against the Roman Catholic Church, the Jewish race, as he put it. He was, he was lauding the Ku Klux Klan. He was raising money by threatening people on the air with youth, uh, revealing their names. And if they didn't make a major donation, they would be revealed on the air. And it turned out he got all kinds of donations from people who were involved in sex trafficking and all kinds of things in Los Angeles. And, and he carried on um, like that with personal attacks, with racist hatred, there he is, um, Bob Schuler, uh, and refused to change his ways. The FCC, it wasn't called the FCC yet, the Radio Commission uh, moved to, uh, pull his license and he challenged them in court. 
The case went all the way up through the California courts. I don't know why in those days a federal case would go into the California courts, went to the California Supreme Court, and from there to the Federal Court of Appeals in Washington, DC. And the Federal Court of Appeals held, upheld the withdrawal of his license. And in their decision, detailed all of this behavior by, by Schuller and said that things like racist, uh, race hatred and, and personal attack and so on did not serve the public interest. So for the first time in that world of electronic media, there was discipline as to content. In 1934, all of that was incorporated into Franklin Roosevelt's Federal Communications Act. And it in turn led to more re regulations. You remember, may remember that radio was used uh, for dramatic purposes uh, by Orson Welles to, to uh, announce that the Martians had landed in New Jersey and that it sounded like a real broadcast. It was rea the first reality TV, reality radio, and it, and it had a reaction. The result, the FCC insisted from then on that you had to announce that on the air in radio that it was a reenactment or it was fictional or it was dramatized. And later on, television would do the same thing. In the late 19... 40s in the wake of World War II and the, and the reality that, that it was well known that radio was used, particularly by the Nazis, uh, to come to power, that Goebbels had said they couldn't have done it without radio, that one of the first things Hitler did when he took power was to create a market, well, they get, literally gave away radios to everyone so they could communicate without filter directly to the mass of people in the country. In reaction to that, in reaction to people knowing that uh, and, and, and fighting a war over with those, with those totalitarian countries, as well as what was seen after the war with uh, Stal Stalin and Russia, in 1949, uh, the FCC adopted something called the Fairness Doctrine. What did that do? That, in, that required that every licensee had to provide people with the right of reply, had to provide people with the ability to, to get the same airtime as someone who might make a personal attack. And it caused the, the industry to take notice. You could, you could file complaints at radio stations in what we call blue books. People in the, in the community could, if they didn't like what they were hearing. What was at stake for them was their survival. And when I came to work at ABC News and in, the, in uh, Network News in early uh, 1978, uh, and they hired me as an investigative reporter, the first thing I had to do was read their standards and practices, which incorporated all the FCC regulations on what you couldn't do and what you had to provide to the public. And, they had, and then they expanded that with their own standards and practices, they added on to that. So it would fit into the way productions actually happened. And then you had to sign it and, and you signed it swearing you had read it and understood it. That, that existed at ABC. When I went to, to 60 Minutes in 1983, it existed at CBS News. I had to do the same thing, read the standards and practices and sign off. Meanwhile, I had learned while I was at ABC because they had made me an executive and had me come to meetings that one of their top priorities when Reagan came in was, these were the networks, the broadcasters, was to get rid of all these regulations, to never have to do them again. They were a pain in the ass. They caused them to not run certain stories and not allow certain people on the air who meant better ratings. And so they lobbied the Reagan administration and the, the FCC commissioner at the time, Mark Fowler, and Fowler, who was very much in favor of all this, rapidly began getting rid of certain regulations until 1985, there was no more fairness doctrine. 1986 is when you get Rush Limbaugh on the air. 1986 is when you start hearing sensational stuff on the radio, both conservative and otherwise, that could never have been on the air in the United States before. And, I, and that progresses into cable, which had no regulation basically as to content, and progressed and was adopted 
with the internet in the early 1990s. So then finally in 1996, you get section 230 in, in, the, inter in the internet law that says that the platforms are not liable, cannot be sued for anything that they put on their platform. They're immune. There's one exception now, which is pornography, and that only happened because of the recent publicity around the epidemic of pornography on the internet. That set the stage it's, to me as, as uh, the 1997, there's a Supreme Court's decision called Reno versus the ACLU, and it basically adopts the doctrine of what I would call pure tolerance. Anything goes on the internet. Why? Because they defined it in 1997 the court as a dial-up service that was not obtrusive. Since then, there has been no Supreme Court decision or major court decision. Since then, there has been no regulation to change the reality of how the internet operates. And I would submit that that's the reason why so many people over all these decades have been educated to believe things that are not true, to adopt ideas and information that we now are stunned by. They don't believe in climate change. They don't believe in uh, scientific ev evidence about a pandemic. Um, they believe the, pres the current president of the United States. And I had, I had sort of not thought about all of that, that all that history until one day in early August of 2015. And it was on that day that Donald Trump appeared, if you remember, at the first Republican de uh, debate, primary debate, and got into a wrestling match with Megyn Kelly. In that wrestling match, she listed what he had called women, dogs, and so on. And then the next day, we have an audio clip of this from CNN, when he was asked about all of this, he went, on, he went further. He basically says, um, he says there was blood in her eyes. There was blood coming out of her somewhere. When I heard that, I said to myself, how the hell is this guy being put on the air? I know the regulations were, got, they got rid of the regulations in 1985, but come on, this is on broadcast TV. They have standards and practices. What happened? What happened is the network executives discovered, and there's a public history to this that I'm not going to bore you with right now. They discovered in, that Donald Trump, big surprise, was great for ratings. They discovered that when Donald Trump decided not to appear at one of the debates, their ratings went down 20, 30 percent to the point that by the end of 2016, Les Moonves, the then CEO and, and um, chairman of CBS, said at an investment meeting in San Francisco, this is great. This circus is making us money. What's good for CBS may not be good for America. And the detailed history of, it, of what went on then, which is still to be written, and I hope to be part of the process and going forward of doing that, will show that the networks consciously kept him on the air because of ratings. Knew what they were doing was not just not in the American interest, but violation of their own standards and practices. But I would also tell you that there's something to remember out of all of this that we can talk about when I, in a minute or two. The internet belongs to you, just like the airwaves. The companies don't want to tell people, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, that they don't own it because they don't, but they don't. It's the same thing with the networks. They didn't want to tell everybody that it belongs to the public. The internet can be regulated for content. It is regulated already for content in a mild way in Europe. Companies are held responsible for what they put on their platforms. There are regulations related to hate speech in Europe when it relates to the internet and personal attack. And it's policed by government agencies. 
It's not going to end the First Amendment. It's not, the First Amendment was never meant to be a, a suicide pact. What's happened is decades of education through public, through electronic broadcasting primarily and digital and the, and the internet that has created a population which does not have, in many cases, access to a good public education as well, as you know, which is defunded. And until we grapple with this issue, I don't think we're going to get out of this problem. And I don't think we're going to avoid a civil war. Okay. A lot of respect for Megan Kelly. She's a lightweight. And, you know, she came out there reading her little script and trying to, uh, you know, be tough and be sharp. And uh, when you meet her, you realize she's not very tough and she's not very sharp. She's no, I just don't respect her as a journalist. I have no respect for her. I don't think she's very good. I think she's highly overrated. But when I came out there, you know, what am I doing? I'm not getting paid for this. I go out there and, uh, you know, they start saying, lift up your arm if you're going to, then I, then, and, you know, I didn't know there'd be 24 million people. I figured, but I knew it was going to be a big crowd because I get big crowds. I get ratings. They call me the ratings machine. So I have, uh, you know, she, she gets out and she starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. And, you know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes, uh, blood coming out of her wherever. Okay, well, that's what set me off. And by the way, um, I just want to say, for, and I know this is being recorded, so um, you, if, if you're looking for more to read, particularly about uh, and get up to speed on uh, the issues around uh, the internet and, uh, and its regulation and, and so on, uh, there's a forthcoming book from Martha Minow, who former dean of Harvard Law School, is now a professor at Harvard, who, who along with her father, Newton Minow, you may remember him from the days of John F. Kennedy, who was the FCC commissioner, who said he watched TV for a, a month, and then he went to the National Association of Broadcasters and said, you've created a vast wasteland, which scared all the license holders. So they, they, so they expanded uh, nightly news from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. They put documentaries back on the air. So in those days, the regulator got the networks to do things. Um, Martha has been a kind of, uh, if you will, a, a sounding board for me getting into this issue, as has Gary Bostwick, an attorney, a First Amendment attorney, some of you may have heard of, um, and one of my colleagues who worked with me on um, this four-hour HBO project called, interestingly enough, Agents of Chaos, which came out last week on uh, HBO, which is about Russia and Trump. And what Jennifer Janish and I, who worked on this together, were talking about all the way through trying to understand, looking in, in a micro way at, at Donald Trump and his campaign in 2016 and its relationship to Russia, is the role the media played, both the internet and the, and the broadcast media in particular, in making Donald Trump, in giving him airtime. As they said during the campaign, as the New York Times mentioned during the campaign, he got $2 billion in free advertising for operating in a way that violated the standards and practices of the broadcasters. That before 1985 would have, been, would have resulted in him being yanked from the air. And that's what educated the public. That's what people were watching. That normalized civic discourse. Um, and then of course, for the investigative reporting program in my own career here at Berkeley, uh, I always like to thank Jonathan Logan. Uh, it was his father uh, um, who endowed our, uh, with my chair, um, David Logan and, and his wife, Reva, uh, and have, been, have become very major supporters of investigative reporting nationally. And of course, my wife, Sharon Tiller, who's put up with me all these years, um, you know, running around and being crazed about various subjects and like this one and, and talking to myself about what the hell is going on here? How can they do this? There must be something behind it. So with that, I'd like, I thank you for sitting still for, all, for this uh, period of time. Um, um, I've now realized that doing a Zoom talk, I better have a teleprompter so I can read what I've written. Um, and I hope it's made sense. And if you've got any questions about um, 
this issue or my career or what it's like to have uh, Al Pacino play you in a movie. Happy to talk. Lowell, well, my question is, uh, a lot of people, when they think about uh, the history of investigative reporting, uh, would think of uh, Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate. Can you explain why that's not investigative reporting? <laughs> well, some people like my, the late Frank McCullough, one of my mentors in the, in the print world, uh, if you've never heard of Frank, uh, you should have. Who's, he passed away at 98 uh, a couple of years ago. Um, he called it leak reporting um, as opposed to investigative reporting. Uh, and Frank, in, in that period of time, let's say going back, the only, the only national investigative reporting team in the country that existed, uh, the first one that was created in 1968, um, was Time Life. Time Life had the first national sort of investigative team and Frank, after he came back from running their, um, their bureau in Saigon, he spent five years in Vietnam, uh, he ran the unit and, and uh, he was skeptical. They had a guy who worked for them uh, named Sandy Smith, an old time investigative reporter out of Chicago, who in the new histories of Watergate people mentioned because Sandy was had, you know, told, Sandy was getting the same leaks basically from the FBI, but also some more original stuff. Um, traditional investigative reporting may involve leaks or, and, or lead. You know, you could say that Jeffrey Wigand and the tobacco story I was doing um, when, I, when I first met him, um, it wasn't about directly about the story that that um, we wound up doing, it was, to, it was to find someone in the tobacco industry who could back up what I was about to say, some documents I had meant. And, and so I had to cultivate him for a long period of time as a source. So you could say it was leaks, but it also required a tremendous amount of corro corroboration, which in the end didn't get me anywhere with my bosses, um, but, but it worked out. But Dangerous Business is a good example. Da a dangerous Business, which was the, what was happening in that thing that worked, ran, when the pill pulled the device, um, uh, be a hand. by chance on 9-11, I'm on an airplane and, and I wound up sitting next to a prosecutor I hadn't seen in four years. And she turns to me and tells me she's going to Tyler, Texas to investigate a company that's systematically killing and maiming its workers as part of its business plan. And I said, well, why are you going to Tyler, Texas? She's a senior federal prosecutor out of Washington to Tyler, Texas. She said, well, the problem is that OSHA, doesn't, OSHA investigators don't get trained in criminal investigation. It's a civil violation. And they're really pissed off out there because the FBI won't investigate because under federal law, it's a misdemeanor to kill a worker. I mean, I know it sounds weird, but under OSHA law, if you, will, if you consciously order a worker to do something that you know may get them killed and they are killed, it is a misdemeanor under federal law. And there's rarely a prosecution using that. So they wanted to get trained. So she was going out to train them. And I wrote down misdemeanor to kill a worker. And then she pointed out to me, it's a felony to kill a wild ass on federal land. So I like those kinds of contradictions. So there's a number of questions in the chat box. Well, you can... Okay, so I, I will ask oh, them for you, um, Lowell. The first one comes from from Stephen, oops, I've now. Why do you think that a civil war is inevitable? Yes. I don't know, I'm not saying inevitable, but um, I have to let me read you a quote, if I can find it. You know, so, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I would have organized this stuff differently and I figured out what I was doing. Um, you, you, may, you may recall last week that a, uh, a man named Caputo in, the, in uh, HHS, a spokesman that came out of the White House, 
um, um, made a remark that uh, about the president and the election and told people that they should go out and get their ammunition ready for the election. Um, I, I want to find the uh, exact quote. I'll read it to you. But what's happening is the president of the United States, after systematically under with the help of Fox News and others systematically undermining the credibility of the quote news media um, then turned to undermining the credibility of certain key federal institutions early on in in his antics I heard from a number of FBI veteran FBI agents and officials and veterans of the CIA that he doesn't know what he's doing. He's really pissing off the FBI and the CIA. They'll, they'll get him or something's gonna happen. Leaks or something like that. Didn't phase him at all. He just kept going. To the point where last year when we were, uh, when we were working on this um, four part series, Agents of Chaos, and where you'll see there's, if you see it, you'll see there's lots of there's John Brennan's in it, there's FBI people in it, and I'm meeting with some people off the record in Washington. I have, in my 50 years in the business, having been a subject of investigation by the FBI and then have studied them and, been, and, and had them as my sources for decades, I have never seen senior federal officials so scared about what's going on. Um, I've been in contact with a number of people in the military and, and while they're pretty optimistic about what will happen and poo-poo the idea that there'll be a civil war or that there'll be violence on any mass scale or that the military will get involved, just over the last week, some of them have said some things in public that indicate that they are getting somewhat more concerned. So I don't know that it's inevitable, but what is breaking down is the civic, is civic civilized discussion um, trust in information and institutions. And, you know, I'm probably am not one of the most uh, respectful of people when it comes to a lot of institutions, because I have seen what they can do and what and how they go wrong. But there is a way that we did have discourse in this country. I was very surprised in 1973, when I started to get paid to do the work that I was doing. I was very surprised that uh, the kind of reporting that I thought was important to do became something that was adopted by the mainstream media, if you will, and encouraged. That we could create something which was the first time that a tax exemption was given to a, an organization, the Center for Investigative Reporting, to do investigative reporting. I've been impressed over time that, that uh, this kind of reporting has had some traction, but it doesn't have the same traction it had before. The last 30 odd years of a defunded public education system combined with a, uh, the use of the public airwaves in a way that's undermined people's faith in the system, fundamental faith, makes me worry that we are maybe on the, on the precipice of real bloodshed in the streets. Okay, thank you. We have six new questions. So from Guy Miko, please say a few words about the unanimous US Supreme Court decision in Reno versus ACLU. Yeah, well, Reno needs to be re-argued. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, I, yes, I know that the prevailing, uh, and Martha Minow has lectured me many times, that the prevailing uh, legal opinions, whether in the Federalist Society or the ACLU, agree that everything should be tolerated on the internet or that uh, there should be no interference um, uh, with, uh, with the platforms, etc. I just don't think it's, it's a doctrine that will not allow the society to maintain civic discourse. And I don't believe the institutions can, can uh, exist uh, 
with what's going on. It's just impossible. In the, and in Reno versus the ACLU, they're talking about a dial-up system and they define it, the internet, as being less intrusive than broadcasting. And it's just not true. You're talking about 1997. And it's obviously completely the quantitative nature of the internet in terms of what it covers, what it carries, all of, I don't remember, I think the statistic is something like 90% of the people get their information from the internet or some digital version of it. So it's no longer what it was. If you want to have, say anything you want to 100,000 people, that's one thing. But when you are talking to masses of people instantaneously without any filtration whatsoever, it's qualitatively something else. And it's not something that existed at the time of Reno versus the ACLU. And I don't know the answer or uh, the legal answer or how it's going to fit into the future precedents. And we may have to go through some tragic incidents like the, what almost happened around the so-called Pizzagate Remember when there was supposed to be an underground group of pedophiles working with Clinton in a pizzeria in downtown Washington, and a guy shows up armed to the teeth? That's what's going to happen. Very scary. Okay, um, Lowell, the next question is from Carol. What do you see as the future of investigative reporting? Is it being funded in a fair way? Well, nobody will in, involved in investigative reporting will say that we have enough money. Um, uh, that's just the way we are. But, um, and, it, and we don't do enough investigative reporting. It's not funded in a uh, vigorous way on a local or regional level. Many of, I mean, San Francisco is a great example. You know, even before the newspapers collapsed here, Right. You don't have a lot of in-depth reporting going on about, well, I know just from walk-ins at our office at Berkeley that there's corruption in the Peralta colleges. But I don't see anybody investigating it. Um, you know, I know that it's, uh, the, the other thing though that is, and on a state level, it's the same way. There's very little coverage going on in Sacramento of what's going on in the, in the state government. And that's true throughout the country in diff to different degrees, but, but that's, there are these so-called news deserts. I do remind everybody that you know, San Diego in 1969 and 70 was a news desert. They had a newspaper, two newspapers, and, and you had TV stations. You had San Francisco, I remember in, um, when I first came here uh, up from San Diego, where you invented happy talk on the local news. That's what it was famous for, the local news here people, you know, kibitzing with each other and making jokes, entertainment. So we still have a major problem in, I think, uh, regionally and locally. Nationally, there are a lot of resources right now. And the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal are all making money and they're all putting in lots of time on national stories. The New Yorker, the Atlantic, and major national magazines are also doing major stories. The critical areas are um, regional and local. And I'm sorry to say, this is one of the reasons why when we did um, A Dangerous Business, why it got so much attention, not only because it was a very long series in the New York Times in print, but also it was a, it was a documentary in Canada and the US. It's because it's so unusual to actually do in-depth stories and have it then presented about working people. It doesn't get ratings usually. It's, we did a whole series on sexual violence in agriculture called Rape in the Fields. Got all kinds of awards because no one's doing it. One of the, one of the, I mean, people ask me, what, you know, how do you get certain stories? Well, we, I've always tried to do stories that no one else is doing. And it always seems to be in the same subject areas. And there's plenty to do that needs to be funded, including taking a good look at, you know, um, at the state of education in this country overall. I see very little concentrated reporting on that. I would, I would suggest, by the way, that since it's the, I did, was, I was thinking about 
What is needed on the internet is a public-private uh, commission, to, uh, possibly led by public universities, to look at the situation and make rec and make recommendations. Something has to happen beyond the traditional government involvement. Thank you for responding to that. Uh, we have a question from Carl Shapiro. Yeah. Could you say more about how the regulations you advocate would not violate the First Amendment as interpreted by today's Supreme Court? The court has taken a very expansive view of the First Amendment, plus unlike broadcast television and radio, Facebook and cable television do not use the public airwaves. Facebook and cable use a means of conveyance that is regulated by the FCC, first of all second and belongs to the public. Uh, on, on the regulations and the First Amendment, I'm not talking about a fairness doctrine. I wouldn't try to do that today, given exactly what everybody knows, that the courts and the, and the uh, organizations, as I said, whether it's the Federalist Society or the ACLU, all agree on a doctrine of pure tolerance, basically. That's the way I describe it, anything goes. So legally, that would be very difficult. But there's no reason why, why anyone is entitled to a unlimited audience that's unfiltered. No one says that you have legally a right to get on the internet and reach a billion people. If you, if, if you want to get, we, could, we would have to have a, a long discussion and studies about what does it take to have a robust discussion reach out to 100,000 people, be able to reach 100,000 people, maybe we decide that's fine. But if you hit a million, you have to meet certain standards because then what you're saying is influencing masses of people. And if you're saying things that cannot be supported, that incite violence, that are false and demonstrably false, and the society believes they're false and dangerous, when they're distributed nationwide, then there has to be a filter of some kind. We used to accept this, for example, I, this is what's so crazy to me, we used to accept this in the issue, on the issue of public health. That's why these public health officers like the Surgeon General walk around with uniforms on, because they're semi-military in nature. They're there to save our lives. And they, they're saying things, they're giving orders that actually can be enforced in court. And I would say that the same public health standards need to be applied to the internet. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Brian Harvey. I feel like the New York Times is creeping towards sensationalism in its reporting. Do you agree? They ed editorialize in the news articles against Trump mostly, which is better than being Trump. But do you agree that their news isn't news these days? Well, I think that what's breaking down is sort of what I was trying to talk about in terms of when I went from, um, let's say, being an, an activist academic and then got in, into the journalism business and I learned there might be another side to the story or that not all cops are bad or in, et cetera, stereotypes and so on that I assume. Um, and, and got a more nuanced perspective. But it seems to me, and I'll give you an example in a minute, it seems to me that there are moments where the objective perspective, which by the way comes from, by the way, didn't exist until there was a telegraph that technology, one telegraph line, and the, the very, and the, by the way, the Associated Press is a nonprofit, I don't know if you know that, but, and it had the telegraph franchise, and it had to figure out a way to, to please all its members, so it came up with this milk toast way of writing, so that all its members would use its copy. That was back in the 1870s, 80s. You can find it in uh, the making of, what's it called? I've, I've forgotten the name of the book, but, um, but in any case, it, it, it's the history of the Associated Press where object, so-called objective writing comes in. What you really mean, though, I think, is being fair, stepping back, uh, not presenting 
um, in advance certain perspectives that will, you just won't entertain certain arguments. I think the, I think the problem here is uh, uh, that we may have reached a, a point where being truly trying to be un, unengaged without making a value judgment is impossible in certain cases. I think we would say the same thing about someone advocating, openly advocating, for instance, let's, uh, the Holocaust doesn't exist, right? It's hard to give that person equal time and equal patience. Uh, Michael Pollan, who write, who's at the journalism school, uh, uh, told me he believes there's only one side of an environmental story. There isn't two sides to the story. Um, so there, there are potentially reasons where the public health, for example, is involved, uh, where you can't necessarily give everybody equal time. It may not be possible in the current crisis. And I'll just give you something that wasn't in the movie, The Insider, uh, that will be in what I'm writing these days. Um, when, when I was ready to put, when Jeffrey Wigand, the, the Brown and Williamson executive, uh, agreed to go on camera and, gave, and did his interview, uh, I promised him not only confidentiality until we went on the air, but that by him taking that risk, which meant he violated his confidentiality agreement with Brown and Williamson, that that meant that we, we were obligated to do everything possible to get his story on the air. I was personally. When the lawyers, if you know, if you've seen the film, it's an accurate meeting with the lawyers, someone's word accurate as to what happened, said, came up with a doctrine that no one had ever heard of before in terms of a public interest story, tortious interference, as it related to the secret that I interfered tortiously with his obligation to Brown and Williamson. No, I mean, I'd been sued a number of times and I'd been through trials and I've been involved in all kinds of, no, but I mean, I didn't know what they were talking about. And I did say to that general counsel, is this Alice in Wonderland? The truer the story, the greater the damages. And that's explained in the movie. What's not in the movie is that they sent it to an outside counsel. The outside counsel came back and I was informed by an executive at 60 Minutes to drop the story, give them all the cassettes and files. They were gonna put it in a vault. And I thought about it for a long time. And then uh, on October 2nd, this is why I remember this, on October 2nd, 1995, at nine o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, I called the president then of CBS News, Eric Ober, in his office, because I knew he got in promptly at nine o'clock, and his secretary put me through. And I said, Eric, the lawyers say we can't run this story because it will put CBS in jeopardy. That's the lawyers, their advisors. What does CBS News say? What do you, as the executive in charge, say? And he said, the corporation will not risk its assets on this story. Now I set that up for a reason. Until that moment, between the time that I was a academic advocate and somewhat of an advocate when I was at the so-called underground or alternative newspaper, I tried to be an objective journalist. I tried to go by the rules. I thought I went super duper rules, if you will, backwards and forwards on this particular story with the lawyers involved all the way. I would talk to the lawyers and send them memos every time I talked to anyone because you have to, you don't know this in the movie. Brown and Williamson sued CBS in 1993 for libel and won the largest judgment in the history of the United States that was stu stood appeal and CBS paid it. Okay. So from the beginning of the story, I didn't do anything without everybody knowing. When Eric Ober said that, to me, the rules changed. 
So if you watch the movie, all of a sudden I'm running around town talking to people in bars and I'm meeting with New York Times and so on. I had never done that, you know, in the then 20 years, well, almost 20 years I had been in network television. Um, I knew I was over the line. I knew I was now an advocate because the rules had been changed. We're no longer on the same wavelength, the same procedure, the same culture, the same way to operate. The company has decided to make a, a decision about what should be public information about the tobacco industry based on the fact that it might take a, a you know, a, a, take it in court, which I didn't, no one believed. And what's not in the movie is that Larry Tisch and his family who were the majority owners of CBS and he was the CEO owned Lorillard Tobacco. It's not in the movie. And which was their big source of money. And one of the eight CEOs who said, I believe that nicotine is not addictive before Congress was his son. And that Wigand, my source, had already testified before a federal grand jury looking into perjury against his son. It's not in the movie and it's never been published actually. But um, that's the background. So there are moments in the business, in my view, where you're a citizen first and a journalist second. Now, granted, in the New York Times, and a number of friends of mine who are, let's say, politically more conservative than I am, who are better in New York Times reporters, well known, um, are very upset with the New York Times moving further and further into advocacy, basically. Thank you, Lowell, and thank you for all the courage you did and demonstrated. Okay, um, our next question is a little more lighthearted um, from Beth Berry. Tell us about the image behind you. Oh, it's Picasso. It's a print. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Beautiful. You have to ask my wife. I'm not allowed to do the art. <laughs> okay, um, a question from Sandra and Ed Epstein. Your prediction of a civil war is quite dire. What causes you to take that position? I, I, I think probably many of you have had the same uh, experience of trying to get into a conversation with someone who's a Trump supporter. Um, the most rational conversation usually is, I don't like the way he behaves, but I like his policies. But I can tell you that, that people that I've worked with um, in the news business, become, um, it's impossible to have a, a, a back and forth. When we were doing the Russia Trump story, I made it a point at the very beginning, there were two things going on. One was my side of it was um, the, when I was still, I was still the Riva David Logan professor. We still had the, I had the program. I also had a, this company we set up that it was then affiliated with the university called Investigative Studios. It's the company that's credited as the co-producer on a documentary. And so it, it, we did a lot of reporting that was based on philanthropic um, uh, donations because the, I can get into it if you want, but the business model for these independent films doesn't involve real reporting and what it costs, it doesn't pay for it. Um, I went after Republican donors. I wanted to, to try to bridge the gap I went and talked with, uh, well, it's not a secret. So I went and talked with uh, the people around uh, the president, both in the media and, uh, his lawyer, and, and his lawyers. I reached out to Giuliani, who I know uh, when he was the prosecutor in Manhattan. And actually he presided over my late older brother's wedding, third wedding. Um, um, I know a lot of law enforcement people who um, served, uh, let's say, in New York, uh, police commissioners and others who were Republican in nature and so on. I went to talk to, um, let's say, the lead investigative reporter for Fox News, um, who appears occasionally, John Solomon, on the Hannity program. 
who's behind all the Ukraine stories. I worked really hard. I got Solomon to talk to Fox about letting him come on the come on to be interviewed about his side of the story. No way. Um, and what does that mean to me? It means that I made, I think, a really intensive effort over a number of years to communicate. And it's almost impossible. They don't, it, it is like talking to someone who has been, who has suspended reason. Believes a set of things that you, at least you could argue over, but they won't. It's, it's, um, you know, it's sad, but I think it's a reality. And what does that mean? If you can't talk and you can't agree on a compromise, look at, look, look, look at what's been going on. Um, what's the alternative? What's going to happen? If you do what Donald Trump did the other night about the Proud Boys, what does that mean? If I were a black person in the United States, seeing the president of the United States talking that way, whether it was Charlottesville or, or two days ago, three days ago, I'd be concerned for my family, for my community. So we haven't seen what we had in 1970, 71, 72. You know, there were more bombings a year during those years than at any other time, according to the FBI, when they ever like collected statistics. There were bombs going off all over the place. There were black and some white people who were convinced it was gonna be an urban guerrilla war and they were operating like there was an urban guerrilla war going on. Airplanes were being hijacked. All kinds of things were happening. So, we were close then in some ways to armed conflict on the streets and in our communities. I knew people in Berkeley, you know, who went out for target practice all the time in those days, you know, and, and had illusions that they were gonna do something. The miracle back then was that it, it changed. Remember, Nixon was, was, had a landslide victory. Nixon had a Houston plan that came out during the Watergate hearings and later was fleshed out in the church committee hearings, which was what I fit into. That's what that security index card was about. They were worried about insurrection and they were preparing for it. And they were bringing the military in when the cities were burning and so on. 82nd Airborne Division was in Detroit. And I know veterans of, veterans of Vietnam who were there in Detroit, who some of whom went to prison later because they were part of the Black Liberation Army. And they managed to get out eventually. So we have had a history, a great long history of violence in this country, civil violence goes back a hundred years or more than a hundred years uh, in our labor history and, and otherwise. And the issues of race, um, income inequality, um, police misconduct uh, are getting very raw out on the street. And the manipulation of what's going on in the media, particularly with the internet, is also very dangerous. And there's no controls over it. So in my initial talk, I was gonna say, look, we may have a civil war. Let's assume there is one. Let's just make a conceit that there is one and we win. We the, what looks like mostly white liberal educated group that's listening today, but our forces win. How do we stop the next one? Because if you remove Donald Trump, this isn't going away. This is, this is baked into our society right now. And there's no plan. No one's talking about how do we undo it. Now, I don't know that what I'm talking about regulating the internet is gonna be the answer, 
it's the only thing I know about. You know, I do know something about, it says in my, my FBI file also, my expertise is propaganda. <laughs> um, uh, so I know something about the, the media industry. I think I know some, I've learned a lot in the last three years about the independent documentary film world and how there are no standards in that in terms of how they report, how they edit. You know, there at least are some standards in the networks. So we do, we've lost a kind of history. People don't know that they own the internet. People don't know they own the airwaves that we could do this. So that's why I thought I would push that aspect of it as a way to maybe see that there's a solution possibly after there's a war or possibly after, um, uh, let's say Trump doesn't get elected and disappears. But there'll be someone much more organized, much with a much more traditional army behind him, if you will, next, unless we do something. Well, Lowell, it's been a... <laughs> I'm laughing <laughs> because I thought I'd escape all of this and retire to West Sonoma County. <laughs> but how, what, are we, what are we gonna do about the air? What are we gonna, I mean, the, I mean this is a, a um, the guy who could, who, the guy who controls the federal forests, is saying it needs to be cleaned up, and he's right. Actually, they do need to be managed, but they're not gonna. So we have some really serious issues, I think, to to confront. And I, I do think, by the way, that the university, um, is an underused platform for addressing a lot of these, these, these issues, these critical issues. I seem to remember one time in my life where there were uh, commissions and other things that were, that involved academic institutions that were convened in order to come to some kind of proposal that would help society figure out what to do next. And it seems to me that that's a function that's disappeared and might be very helpful. Well, with those <laughs> thoughts in mind, and um, you know, we're now approaching 3 p.m. So I'm gonna close the question and answer. And- There are really 60 people on here? Well, there were 79, so oh, okay. there's, yeah, there's still 60. <laughs> Well, and, I promise next time I do this, I'm going to, I'm going to do it with a lectern and or a prompter. It, it, it was very amazing. I, I think we all value. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> we all value that you, you know, told us the truth. And um, we also appreciate your steadfast courage and all the work that you've well, done. I'm not as, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm old. So like, I, I've noticed that I'm, I'm, um, what was I going to say? It, it's, this is really a young person's uh, project. I'm happy to help out, but I think uh, this, is, this isn't going to go away anytime soon. Yes. Yes, I think, I think we hear you. And um, in closing, I just want to thank you for sharing your insights telling us the truth and um, illuminating the path that we all need to take in the future. It's a good start at least today, October 2nd. Yeah, corporation will not risk its assets. So <laughs> it's our right. right, yes, you took- up front, so. <laughs> you took on CBS. So. Well, I don't, you know, I, I honestly, I didn't have anything to lose at that point. I, um, except my, maybe my, normally what happens is what's happened to a lot of people is they get discredited. That's the big fear. 
Oh, yes. Because the institution can discredit you, you know, and, and, and journalists in particular like to say negative things about each other. They just love got negative gossip. That's why they're at bars all the time. <laughs> and what else are you going to talk about? Um, and I know when the, when, when the, after that, th October 2nd, when an article appeared in the New York Times, I don't know how that article appeared, um, that, that is in the movie, the Don Hewitt guy says, um, how did they know everything we were saying inside? And, you know, when I was, um, I was getting feedback from people I knew who were at lunches with people I knew who were saying, well, what did Bergman do wrong? He must've done something really bad. I mean, he must've really up this time. And, you know, and that's, that's, that's one of the hard parts of, of, I think, any business when you get into fighting what's going on is you have to be prepared for people to run the other way. Yes. And to trample all over you on the way out. Yes. Well, or, or you set up some, so I had a way out. I lived in Berkeley. I never moved to New York except for a nine month period to play uh, executive. I knew I might get fired by ABC or CBS or whomever. And I didn't, I grew up in New York and I did not want to be living in New York city without a job. Um, and knowing that Berkeley really well, I felt I lived in a community where some people probably looked at me as being odd, but that fit in perfectly. Um, and, um, so it was a, it was a, um, how should I put it? A, 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 I think the best decision I made, which is never, I always refused to move. You know, they say, well, you got to move to New York. We'll double your salary. You know, I said, oh, can't do it. Sorry. Um, and so that's how I survived. I just didn't get in the middle of the place and I didn't want to be a boss. So thank you for your time. And, um, you know, I hope I can meet some of you in the flesh sometimes.